going to convene the December 3rd Energy and Environment uh, Committee to order. I see uh, two of my colleagues here. I would ask Mr. Weezer, who I don't think is going to make it, but Mr. Labange might make it in to uh, find their way to uh, the committee room. Um, members, Mr. Brieto, I'd like to just uh, uh, continue an item. Sir. Uh, let's see here. What item is it, Mr. Prieto? Is it number five relative to the uh, That's staff right. resources plan? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and continue item number five, and I understand that the Public Works Commission will take that item up on the 15th of December, and then we will hear it first week, uh, first uh, meeting in January. Mr. Koretz. Yeah, if, if I could just uh, say this is one of the city's largest and most important undertakings, and hopefully we won't slow it down enough to throw it off. So anything we can do to move it quickly, uh, uh, I think is pretty critical. So I appreciate us scheduling it early in the, in the year. Item number one. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Item number one relates to residential sewer service charge appeal for the property located at 7646 Memory Drive in Tahunga. This matter was continued from your committee on October 1st, 2014. You have staff from the Bureau of Sanitation and the City Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council Members. Lisa Maury, Chief Financial Officer for LA Sanitation. The sewer service charge appeal before you today is for the property at 7646 Memory Drive. In 2012, Sanitation received a request to exempt this property from sewer service charge and for a refund of sewer service charges that had been paid due to the fact that the property was served by a septic tank, which has been confirmed. The request was made by Anatole Holding, LLC, which is the trustee of Sergei Manko, um, who was the account holder who is deceased. A refund was issued from 2003 to 2006, and also for April 2012, when Manko was the sole account holder. However, during a six-year period from 2006 to 2012, there was a second name on the account, Ms. Luzine Tatarian, uh, Mr. Manko's wife. So after attempts uh, for us to get a joint claim form from both parties to issue a single refund, um, on advice from the city attorney based on the refund uh, being joint property during the time of the marriage, sanitation split the refund for each party uh, which came to approximately $1,800 $1, for each of them. Anatole Holding is appealing this decision. They felt they should have received the entire refund for that time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And we also have Lori Rittenberg from the City Attorney's Office here. Very good. Uh, I don't see a card being filled out by the appellant. Is the appellant present? Okay. It doesn't look like the appellant is present. Colleagues, do you have any questions on this item? Very good, colleagues. Uh, hearing and seeing none, uh, the uh, um, action will be to deny the uh, sewer charge appeal request for the additional refund as the sole claimant for the period March 30th, 2006 through to March 29th, 2012, based on the municipal code and the rules and regulations for the administration of the sewer, sarge, sewer service charge. Thank you. Very, very Thank good. You. All right. That'll be the order. All right. Let's go ahead and take items two and three together, please. Certainly. Item number two and three. Number two relates to motion Fuentes Bloomfield relative to request the Department of Water and Power to report in regard to the internal independent assessment of its customer information system conversion and TMG's consulting report findings. And the third item relates to motion Fuentes Bloomfield relative to request the Department to report on converting to, uh, to a 30-day billing cycle. So you have staff in Department of Water and Power. Good afternoon, Mr. Howard. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members, Randy Howard, Senior Assistant General Manager of the Power System at LADWP. And so if you'd like to, I'm prepared to go items two, three, and four uh, in this presentation, and I think they all kind of relate. So if you'd like to take up all three, uh, we'll be able to do that. Sure, let's do that. So we have, have a presentation uh, prepared. This is a presentation that we have presented uh, to our board as well. Uh, the, the purpose of this presentation is really to discuss uh, the implementation of LADWP's customer care and billing and mobile workforce management system. 
that experienced, as you know, a number of problems. What we're hoping to accomplish with this is to discuss the lessons learned regarding the causes of those problems, outline the steps that we've taken, and provide an outlook in the future activities that we have uh, going on at LADWP. Some of the background, and some of this you're aware of, the customer information system is our underlying foundation of our LADWP operations and the key link really to our customers. The problems we encountered in this implementation of this new system, we understand clearly were very harmful to our customer relations, the department's perception, and even the internal morale of our own employees. While disappointing, the experience provides valuable lessons and that was really the reason for this deep dive into the root cause analysis. I think we committed to, to this committee early on that when we thought the system was stable enough, we would take a deep dive, look at some of the root causes, and try to ensure that we took advantage of learning from that and sharing that information, and that's the purpose of this presentation. So what went wrong? We brought in a third-party outside consultant to conduct a root cause analysis, and they found three key issues. First was inadequate project management and oversight on the project itself. There was vendor inexperience with a level of system complexity and that was really, this was a very complex project and it was determined that the vendor had uh, some inexperience related to something this complex. Unprepared workforce, meaning that our workforce really wasn't prepared for as the system went go live in the implementation activities. And then we had a failure to, to listen to some of the concerns that were raised with our quality assurance contractor. So to put this in perspective, the department early on brought in a third party to help with the RFP to choose the system integrator. That system integrator was PricewaterhouseCoopers that was selected. The system uh, for the billing engine itself was an oracle that was selected. Uh, it's used throughout the industry, and it was determined one of the best uh, systems for our type of services. And then we had hired a quality assurance firm. Five Point Partners was selected to assist the department in the oversight and quality assurance. So the department went out and hired what we thought were the best folks to help us get this done. But as we found out, obviously in the implementation, we had some failures along the way in this project. So let me jump into some of the details that were determined from the report uh, from TMG. There was inadequate project management. There was missing and ineffective critical decision making regarding a number of things. So there was a lot of evidence that the customer care and billing as well as the mobile workforce management was not ready uh, to go live. But there was a lot of pressure also to bring it to go live. Already the system that we were using at the time was very frail. It was a billing engine, as we've discussed before, almost 40 years old. And it was very frail. It was barely hanging in there. We weren't putting a lot of money into it because we were replacing it. So the longer the delays occurred, the more risk we had that the system itself would fail. The organization's lack of preparedness for daily operation of the new system. Because the programming went on right up to the go-live date, a lot of the training wasn't done uh, with the staff, and they weren't prepared for once we went go-live. And there was a lack of detailed project plan to manage and track the project status and monitor the implementation through the, the project itself. Some of the breakdown of some of those issues, they used a project team approach, a cross-sectional approach, as opposed to a single project manager. Most everybody involved in the project had other responsibilities as well. So it led to some poor decision making and some lack of accountability uh, within the project management. There were some warning signs along the way, and it was determined 
by the consultant that some of those warning signs uh, were ignored by the management team. One of the findings was the project also was overly ambitious in project scope and it grew as the implementation date came nearer. So there were along the way a number of changes. The, the initial scope wasn't quite adequate as they got into the project they determined there were more interfaces, more complexity. All of that required scope changes along the way. The team overlooked the problems with the new system due to, again, the increasing pressures and things that I had just mentioned regarding the need to replace the existing system that was having its own issues. And we had a lot of um, oversight in, in the spending and trying to keep the, the control on the spending of the existing system because we knew we were replacing that system and so there was pressure to to go live with the new system. Some of the vendor inexperience issues that were found by TMG. PwC and Oracle were selected as the lowest cost alternative. They were determined initially to be qualified and experienced. But it was determined through TMG that this was the largest and most complex utility billing system replacement project that they had ever managed. It was also determined that the PwC project manager was not necessarily experienced and seasoned in this system itself. And they had a lot of turnover in their own team during the project. So there was a lot lack of consistency that was found. The report also identified LADWP's own project team did not adequately identify some of these gaps with PwC and their experience. Some of the highlights of the unprepared workforce. Uh, it was determined, and this committee has helped us since we went go live, there were some staffing constraints with the civil service exam process. It impeded some of the early implementation efforts to hire, train, and prepare staff for the new system. There was also some inefficient staffing to handle some of the implementation problems and led to very long call wait times and uh, some of the significant issues you've uh, heard in the past regarding some of the bill bills themselves. Also, as indicated, the late system integration, mean, meaning programming right up to the go live date resulted in some lack of testing on the system itself and there was little time for the staff training and some of the secure user access issues weren't addressed meaning uh, folks had access to things that when you went go live that you might have changed had you had more time to prepare for that. Additional implementation problems that came out of this. So once we went go live, as we've reported to this committee before, the highest percentage of estimated bills, we went up to 21% of our bills were estimated during the peak. High billing defects in dollars and accounts were as high as 160 million and 74,000 accounts in delayed bills and defects. The billing issues delayed the orderly implementation as well on the collection process and led to very high delinquent balances for many of our customers. Average call wait times, while we say 33 minutes here, we know at times they exceeded an hour. So what did we do to fix the problems? As we've reported to you previously, we had some leadership transition. I was brought in. We, we made some additional changes to our team. We focused also at the request of this committee on increased transparency in our communication. We now do a weekly dashboard of all of our metrics. We've also increased our community outreach. We've had a number of community meetings out there specific to our billing issues. We've refocused a lot of resources on critical issues 
We've moved customer services organization under the power system to integrate it and be able to utilize more resources <coughs> as needed to fix any of the problems that have identified. We've hired additional customer service representatives. We've hired additional meter readers as well. Other things that we've done, we've developed formal training curriculums for new and existing employees. We now have a formal training group within our customer services division. I think, Councilman, you've had an opportunity to, to come over and see some of that activity going on. So all new customer service reps go through a very intense 12-week training program. We've been working on retraining our existing staff to be better able to use this new system. We've engaged supplemental technical assistance, partly to do the root cause analysis report, work on system stabilization, reporting functionality. Uh, we had a, a lack of reports to help us determine where we were in some of the process. So we're working on developing and reinstituting a number of report <coughs> functionality, additional customer enhancements, and data cleanup activities. We've been working on addressing the collections. As you know, there have been times where we have stopped our collections and severance activities. We've reinitiated that, but we've reinitiated it at levels that wouldn't cause great challenges with our call center and the call wait times. So we've also been quite lenient with our customers, understanding that many of the challenges they're facing were a result of our own doing in our billing system or their inability to get access to us. Current status of estimated bills, and uh, this says October, and it only says October because we, we wanted to stay with the presentation that we have posted and provided to our board. We do have some updated information and it's part of our weekly report. But as you can see, we've decreased our estimated bills by over 75%. We're under 5%. And that, that level is what we think is prudent utility practice, 5% in our service territory because of accessibility uh, for locked gates, animals, and other issues. We're going to have a number right in that range on an ongoing basis. Mr. Howard, what is sort of the, uh, I, you say industry standard is about 5%, but what is sort of our pattern in history for the city of Los Angeles for estimated bills? I mean, what, 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 is, what do we typically sort of run at when So you're going to see some of these numbers are as good as the department has been at any point in the past. So but there, 3 to 5% would be a range that would be ideal for us. Okay, and that's sort of based on our history, 3 to 5%? Based, based on our history and industry average. So we're operating within our history now with, at the 4.7, at least as, as of October. What's the latest number? The latest number, actually, it's gone up just a little bit, but it's hovering right in the 5% range. Okay. Delayed bills. As you can see, we've had an 80% decrease in delayed bills. In January, we had 75,000 customers. Now, uh, we are under 15,000 customers. And as you can see, we've went from 160 million to about $35 million. Uh, delayed bills uh, can be a number of reasons. Uh, could be that it determines there's a potential uh, incorrect meter read or other issue, and it just means it does not issue the bill after reading the meter within a three-day period. And so it means that some other touch point has to occur in order to get that bill out. Current status of call wait times. So as of October, which was a, actually a very busy month still because we were dealing with a lot of customers that had received their bills for the summer period, the hottest period, and those are typically high bills and some of our highest call volumes. The average was seven minutes. Uh, lately, we have been averaging under four or five, and I was concerned that Council Member LaBonge would be here and dial that phone. It's, it's a tough day for us. Uh, I think it would be a good phone call, but as you can imagine with the weather, uh, when I was driving over here, I think we had still about 4,000 customers without power currently. Primarily, we've had a lot of cars hitting poles and other types of issues out there. And a reminder, people need to slow down in this weather. Uh, but our crews are fully 
engaged in making repairs, but our call center has been quite busy and we staffed up uh, related to the storm activities. Next steps. So current leadership is certainly focused on the customer issues and responsible for the progress to date. We continue to commit more resources to project scoping activities at the early stages. We are, we are working at how we're going to address additional projects like this. Again, this was 40 years since this, this system had been installed. So we, we hadn't taken on a project like this. Uh, since I've been involved myself, I've spoken to a number of utilities that have put in new billing systems. And many of them have experienced very similar experiences we have, uh, some with different system integrators, some using SAP versus Oracle, uh, but they've had a lot of very similar issues. We've tried to work with them to understand how best to use our resources to get to a good operating system sooner. So we're trying to use lessons learned from, from what they went through and then also share what we've gone through. We've had a number of utilities come in that are behind us and to use the information that we've learned so they don't make the same mistake because we think we should share that. Project management deficiencies. We are reevaluating at the department how we go about project management, looking at that team approach versus putting experienced project managers on complex implementation projects. We are working hard at identifying additional project management talent and then focusing on some training for any of our managers that are doing project management going forward. Customer service orientation. So we're now refocusing that all employees become much more focused on improving customer service and we all recognize that it's everyone's responsibility even though customer service might be the direct interface most of the time it's everyone's responsibility to support their efforts and to do what we need to do to ensure that that customer relationship is stronger and better we have proposed department-wide customer service training and accountability we are working on developing and implementing customer service metrics and additional dashboards to ensure that we continue ongoing measuring and monitoring of our actions related to customer service. We'll continue with our increased transparency. As you know, we have the ongoing weekly dashboard on uh, our initiatives. We've put new metrics uh, s specific to our lessons learned on project activities. And we're going to continue with more project or more customer outreach to address specific programs and changes. Uh, one of the things we did to try to assist our customers is we had a number of bill resolution Saturdays at some of our service centers. While now we're not seeing the need for that, we're still choosing to open some of our service centers at least once a month on Saturdays. And what we're offering is an opportunity for our customers to come out and learn more about DWP and our programs. So we're offering most of our programs and having our experts on the various programs, such as energy efficiency, water conservation, solar, electric vehicles. And so our customers will have that opportunity going forward. What can our customers expect? They can expect an accurate and a timely bill going forward. We, we're not saying today all problems are fixed. We have folks still working on defects and tasks. We have technical folks and operation folks working on activities. But the system is stable and the vast majority of activities are there, but our customers can expect accurate and timely billings. We're implementing more quality assurance. What we're trying to do is catch the problems and not our customers catch the problems. We'd rather find it ourselves versus having them call. We're also more self-service options. We don't want our customers to have to call through the call center to do business with us if they'd rather use a different medium. And so we've put in place a larger number of 
online self-serve options that our customers can utilize and not even have to call a service rep. I won't go through those details. So on item, I think this was item four before us on paperless billing. So one of the, the items that was raised by this committee was as we look to go to, to monthly billing, how do we ensure that we don't just double up on paper and people? And uh, we heard very clearly from this committee that you wanted us to focus more efforts on paperless billing, reducing the amount of paper we use as an entity and the mailing. So our board has now approved an incentive for paperless billing. We're going to provide each of our customers that chooses this option a one-time billing credit of $10 to increase the customer adoption of paperless billing. We're going to provide them, they can receive electronic notifications that they have their bills and communications on how to, uh, to pay those bills online. The customers will have that choice to stop receiving their paper bill. Currently, we have 135 customers that have chosen this option, and that's about 9%. The industry average, as we've looked around, is 16%. So we know we have a lot of room just there, but we want to do even better. And we'll certainly seek your support in helping us communicate and utilizing this program because we think this, this is the direction that we should go and we want to go. So the incentive program, as I mentioned, will be $10. It'll be applied to their bill. They need to remain enrolled in the program for 12 months. That's six bills that they would see currently at the bi-monthly billing. We're launching the program starting January 1st and we'll be offering the incentive through June 30th. We estimate the cost will be up as high as 1.6 million, but the estimated first year savings could be as high as 1.1 million. So we think our payback's about 1.4 years. We think that's a great payback for this program and to help us uh, reduce paper. So item three is you asked about monthly billing, because we committed to you. That's one of the reasons we needed to do this project, is to have additional features and opportunities for our customers uh, regarding their bills, their information, their data. And we wanted to get to a place that we could start offering monthly billing. We know many of our customers, fixed income, low income, it is very challenging for them to save the money necessary to pay a two-month bill. So we're going to launch a focused monthly billing program starting in Q1 of 2015, as well as a level pay program. So level pay meaning that we're just going to look at your historical usage, and we're going to take that historical usage, and we're going to give you a level pay plan. So every month you pay that amount, and then we'll true up after 12 months. Every 12 months, we'll true up. If you use a little bit more, you'll pay a little bit more. If you lose a little bit less, we'll credit you towards your next, or it could even be a refund. So we're going to kick that off in Q1 of 2015, and we'll really target a lot of our lower income for that program. We're going to pilot monthly billing on several routes. We want to phase this one in. We want to make sure we don't cause any more problems for our customers. So we're going to phase it in. We have an area up in Owens Valley that we're, we're just going to start with up there. Owens Valley only has electric service from DWP. We don't serve water or sewer or trash. So we're going to phase in electric up there, make sure it's working. And then we're, going to, we're also choosing a community in Venice Beach that every customer in that, that vicinity has drive-by meters. So those are the easiest for us to implement without adding a, a lot of staff. Make sure the system's working. We currently do have several thousand customers, residential, getting monthly bills, so we know the system's working. We just want to start testing the volume and ensure that as we're doing this, we're really pushing the, um, the communication to get more customers to sign up for paperless billing. We want those to coincide. So before 
you get the opportunity to go monthly billing, we want to make sure we've tried to hit you up several times to go on paperless. So we're going to continue increasing our program offerings and providing, as mentioned, more customer tools uh, going forward. One of the lessons learned to here was we need a backup call center. Uh, we, need, we need a call center capability to, to at least cover all the average levels we're going to hit. But we know there are some peak times that we're going to have ex excess calls. As well, there's going to be some potential emergencies. Uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we had an evacuation of our building due to alarms going off. And all of our call center reps had to leave the phones to evacuate the building. And anybody who called during that period of time, it wasn't even a busy signal. It just rang. That's unacceptable. We need a backup call center. Um, we're, we've put an RFP out. We have the bids in. We're, we're working with labor now. We need to move that forward. Does the system have the ability to answer and say that we're experiencing technical difficulties and that uh, please try, I mean, presumably a system of this caliber would have that type of technology? We did have that capability uh, because of the, the urgency of the evacuation uh, that wasn't triggered. It was also the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So what, when you might have had normally some additional staff there, you did not. You were, you were light on staff. The, and so. the system doesn't have remote capabilities. I know when I use auto dialers for campaigns, I can dial in from everywhere and, and program. And program that? that? I'll have to get back to you. I don't know that we have that feature. But that, that would be good. If we don't, we should get it. I, I can do it. All right, so the, this is just a summary of what I've already explained to you, and I don't know that I need to go through that. But at this time, I would certainly be happy to uh, respond to any questions you might have. Very good. So l let me begin with um, thanking you for the presentation and acknowledging I've done it, I think, every time we've had a conversation around the billing system uh, that you largely, as, along with our new general manager, inherited this problem. Uh, and I think it's important for us to recognize that because a lot of the shortcomings that are pointed out in the report, I think, very clearly underscore the point that this is a failure in management of this rollout. Whether it's PwC or whether it's the city of Los Angeles' utility, we have failed our ratepayers. Um, and a lot of us are inheriting this problem just like you did because we took office, Mr. Blumenfield and I, for example, on July 1st. System blows up a month and a half later, and now, you know, 14 months later, we're still surviving this catastrophe. But I think it's the last time that I will say sort of that we inherited this problem because we have thoroughly, I think, owned it. Um, so that being said, um, where – so the lead-up to this hearing has been largely making sure that the system gets stable so that we perform the core functions that the utility is supposed to be doing in a efficient and capable manner. And again, we have failed in doing that. And this overview, I think, is helpful to give us sort of a global perspective. But some of the issues that uh, I think were uh, elements leading up to sort of the catastrophic rollout were, uh, I don't think, described in, in this for me, at least. I know this is a, a report uh, on sort of what the failure was and the management failures. But help me understand, are we stable? And, and before, Randy, you answer that, are the meter uh, routes sort of working now? Because that was, I think, the beginning of the failure. The, we weren't able to properly route the meter readings. And as a result, we had to do estimations and we had to do these default rules. So before I get there, are we uh, at 100% stability as it relates to getting out and reading meters now and getting those routes assigned? We are. I think from both a resource perspective as well as a systems perspective, um, we are stable. So for, from, a, from a meter reading capability, we, we are dispatching uh, meter readers. They're getting out. Right. We're not estimating, with the exception of sort of what's normal, uh, we're not estimating, grossly estimating uh, meter reads like we were when the problem started. No, we are not. So that element of the system is stable. The... Uh, that then led into sort of the uh, problem with us having to estimate meter reads and, as a result, estimate bills. 
and we had this rules that were set up in defaults and and the worst case scenario we defaulted to rule three which was grossly grossly sort of out of whack if we're not if we're properly reading meters and uh, not estimate anymore how much and i know that you alluded to it i think the number was seven thousand how many sort of uh, uh, bills are out there that haven't been reconciled yet with how, how much is left to true up with actual reads and our estimates because there's got to be a batch of work out there that still I hope is small but how much is left for us to true up we're we're issuing about 40,000 bills a day and out of 40,000 about 2,000 kick out for some various reason and so some of those do get estimated to, to get them out and or some have some additional touch point. We still have several thousand outstanding bills that have some other touch point issue that requires some type of field change, some something with the system. The data the data does not want to bill. And so those are all being worked down now. And um, as you saw, it was significantly more. We've been working those down. We still do have some of those outstanding ones to do. And it, it's in the, the thousands range. So uh, every day, uh, there's still some that are being kicked out. Correct. And those are in the thousands range. So that's not yet 100% stable. No, that, that was normal business even prior to. And that's the system, it, it puts boundaries of what's expected to be normal. And if it, if it sees a read, that doesn't appear to be normal, it's not gonna, it chooses not to bill it. And so then it takes a, another path and a process to look at it. And in some cases it will estimate. Now it's looking, because we have, we have months of data now and months of actual bills that might have built. So it might look historical at the actuals instead of coming up with some gross estimate based on system. So it's looking at their actual usage from historical to do that estimate. But, um, it will kick out because it, it might be high or it might be too low. So something significant changed. A customer decided they, uh, they were going to allow a filming entity to film in their house uh, a show for a week. And that show comes in there, pays them some money to use their house. They plug in all over the place. Uh, when that bill, that electric bill, the meter reader reads it and it kicks into our system, it says, this cannot be possible. And so it throws that, that read out. It says there's just no way. So it, it will either issue them the estimated bill or it will go in a delay pattern until somebody has to manually touch it and determine, is this actual? Is this real? Or was, was it an error? Did someone plug in something wrong? Did the data translate wrong? What happened? And so that's it, in the it, thousands, you say, and yes. it's sort of within the regular sort of variability right. from a systems perspective. So I think that's good news, although maybe alarming to some. But how much is sort of in the batch that is still in dispute? Uh, I mean, do you have an accounting for how many folks are still saying, previous to sort of the stability, or prior to where we are today, how much is out there where folks are still going back and forth with you all trying to, to reconcile their bill? It's, it's several thousand, not much more. Okay. I mean, it, I'm going to look over here. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think we're in the several thousand. It's not, it's not a big number. If a customer had a problem, most of that was a historical issue. It hasn't been recent. And so some of them still had not uh, resolved all of those as they've gone through. As we've pursued some of the delinquency balances, customers have had to come and then resolve what might have been a, a, a bad issue to them. We've been able to work through those. We have a, a large number of customers and payment programs as we've resolved those, uh, but it's it's only in the thousands. So, so I'm looking at this in Toronto. So, so you've got sort of the day to day within the variability that's normal in terms of what's being kicked to estimates or being held for an additional touch point. You've several thousands there. You know, getting uh, uh, some some more. Uh, finer numbers I think would be helpful for me. Okay. Uh, then you've got the batch here that is still in dispute and sort of being reconciled. You say that's several thousands. Ms. Edwards, when she was here at the last uh, uh, update, testified that there were about 6,000 sort of bills that had yet to be sent out and hadn't been since we stopped sending bills out at the beginning of the year. Um, have we caught those folks up 
uh, or is that part of that second group that I'm mentioning where that we're reconciling? It's still there. There are some still lingering in that second part that requires some additional something additional that needs to be done. Okay. So 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 for me, it'd be really helpful that we know exactly sort of the universe of customers that are out there that are either uh, getting estimates or delayed bills, uh, getting uh, a bill that hadn't gotten a bill, and. Uh, and, and making sure that folks are understanding for us how many folks are out there that still have to have their bills reconciled. I mean, I think that's important because if you have three, three, and three, you've got 9,000 people out there. And I'd rather not guess how many people are out there still in some sort of bill limbo. Um, so there, they, those were those elements. Uh, and so you had sort of the meter reads and the routes that didn't work. You had sort of the, the touch point with the customer that w wasn't sort of getting out there. Um, and then we get to sort of this uh, sort of this point where we're trying to figure out what happens so that, as you said at the opening, we don't repeat these, uh, I'm paraphrasing, we don't make these same mistakes again. And it's, and it's my intention to make sure that we don't micromanage but are in constant communication so that we understand going forward how to avoid these tremendous uh, catastrophic sort of uh, outcomes. Um, so that brings me to uh, wanting to know where we are. There was a request made by Assemblymember Boca Negra to the state auditor to have this, and it was accepted to have audited. Where are we in the state audit with sort of all of this? So the state auditors have been on site um, since probably June. They just completed their on site activity in November. Uh, they've indicated to us that they're done with all on-site. There's still some, a few outstanding data requests. Uh, they have indicated to us that we could expect a draft report probably in February would be the earliest they would have it out. And that's from their, their most recent um, discussions with the department. So um, we've been, there was some concern initially that there was, uh, uh, we, we weren't maximizing the, the uh, collaboration with their office, that they've got all the data that they've asked for, they're doing their audit, it's out of our hands at this point? That is correct. We, we initially had some concerns about uh, how they access data, customer information, what they did with it, uh, confidential information. Uh, we, we developed some protocols to follow to ensure that we, we didn't have any issues with secure information um, regarding the power system or even some of the specific customer data itself. Uh, they could look at, you know, numbers and things, but when it came to addresses and we, we worked out a protocol uh, and after that point, uh, I think they, they were fine with their requests, their interviews, and like I said, they, they had stayed at the department quite a long time and received a lot of information, and so we'll wait and see. We think this root cause analysis captures probably the vast majority of the issues, but until we see their report, we won't know. Got it. And so coming back to sort of the rate payer for a second, um, or for more than a second, I, I think that the report was, was pretty alarming, and it, you know, speaks to critical project deliverables that were never produced, data conversion validation that was never performed, no financial testing was performed. I mean, it speaks to a, a lot of these things. And I think it's good to know that from a customer service perspective, there's additional training and making sure that we're being more responsive to the rate payer. I don't know where we can sort of point to in terms of how it is that we're going to avoid these types of sort of uh, mistakes again other than sort of reflecting on all of this. And the only way that I can sort of account for it in my mind is to try to understand what did this ultimately cost the ratepayer. I know that we had to pay for additional patches with PwC and uh, additional sort of data services to try to help triage and stabilize the situation. What more did we pay than we were expecting to pay? I mean, I know that we touched upon it in a different meeting. Um, but to me, that's really important for us to know. I don't know how else to sort of hold all of us accountable unless we understand really what this ended up costing the ratepayer. And separate and aside from what it is that we had to pay in addition to what we expected to pay, there's also the matter of the undercollection. So we undercollected to the tune of $300 million. And while I know that the report said that this wasn't affecting the city finances and our transfer wasn't going to be jeopardized, there's a real loss there for the ratepayer. That money 
could have been banked. It could have, we could have earned a float on it. We could have made money on what it is that we typically do. Having under, an under collection of $300 million must have cost the ratepayer something. Do you have any sense today, and I'm happy to sort of talk about it at the next meeting, but ultimately what this ended up costing uh, the department and the ratepayer in terms of additional contracting services that weren't otherwise expected and that under collection that was, in my opinion, just absolutely massive, how much did this cost us? So the only additional contract that I'm aware of that we have put forward is a $16 million contract with Oracle for additional Six zero 16, 16. 16 million with Oracle for additional technical support to, to help us with some of the stabilization efforts. As you stated, the under collections are a very significant amount. Uh, they were as high as 300 million uh, right now. They're probably closer into the $200 million range. We have not written that off. We have put reserves aside sufficient to cover a portion of that, and we'll certainly be prepared to come back before this committee to discuss the specifics. Uh, we, we are moving forward on those collection activities and think much of it is recoverable, but there will be some level that is not. And so that does come at a cost to all of our ratepayers. Um, those that didn't pay obviously are on the benefiting side, but those that, that paid their bills and continue to pay their bills um, were, were cost-based. So if someone doesn't pay, that means the rest of the, the ratepayers have to pick that up. So the under collection today is still around $200 million thereabouts? It, it is around $200 million, and again, we've, we've tempered that based upon trying to keep the call wait times uh, at a lower level. And so we're, we're ramping down those metrics uh, much slower than we, we had initially wanted to. But they, they're difficult calls, and they take quite a lot of time. So we're making sure that our customers can get access to us and, and moving that forward. On, on that note, because, again, to me, that is uh, really uh, uh, sort of alarming. I mean, the good news is that $100 million came in through the door. The, the bad news is that but for this incident, we wouldn't be chasing money, and that costs money, et cetera, et cetera. At what point, how do you all, uh, understanding this is an extraordinary circumstance, at what point do you make the decision that you can't collect a portion of that? And how is that, uh, you'll have to educate me here, how is that sort of uh, approved? Does the commission then approve your, in the next budget cycle, do they do it sort of separate and aside? Um, how, how will that sort of be addressed and transparent so we know what it is that we paid for this mistake? So it, it would be addressed by our board, and we would, we would propose uh, a potential write-off and how we would go about that. Uh, we are currently working with um, some consultants that we might bring in that are specialized in this uh, and to help us do risk assessment on the collectability of some of these funds. Because if we're going to put the resources and target them, we want to ensure that that we are, are applying the, the, the appropriate resources versus some level of just write-off. Um, so there are some firms out there that have done this with a number of these billing implementation uh, projects. Uh, there's a firm we've been discussing that has done some work with PG&E up in north. They had a, a very similar implementation problem, uh, very significant write-offs as well in delinquencies. Um, and so they have been advising us on, on how we might go about it. We do not have a plan in place, but I'm certain by the, the next time we would meet here, uh, we, we should have a plan. Have the rating agencies changed our credit rating as a result of all of this? They have not. Uh, we have kept them informed of the activity. We've been transparent with them on everything we ensured uh, to, in, to, to give them the comfort level we did put aside uh, sufficient funds uh, to cover, cover the delinquency, and if we need to, we'll be able to draw upon those funds. And with that, I think they, they were comfortable that we had an action plan in place that was sufficient. The, uh, uh, what other sort of major rollouts do you see uh, in the future for the system? You mentioned the monthly billing, which is something that I'm um, excited and nervous about. Um, 
uh, starting in the first quarter of next year, it sounds like you're putting the proper controls and sort of batching the release to make sure that it works. Um, I think it's really important for all of us colleagues to, to hear Mr. Howard's sort of cry or, or rather uh, concern about having redundancy systems in place for the customer service interface aspect of the job. I, we do it everywhere else. We don't do it with the utility and we should really consider figuring out how to do that. But as you roll out this, it sounds like there's uh, decisions and opportunities for us to sort of uh, all make sure that the boxes have, checked, have been checked and that the rollout's going to work. Um, what else after this do you see sort of being the next significant upgrade or rollout in this system so that we can begin to prepare and ask all of the questions that presumably weren't asked at least by the commission, it appears, or by this council? What's after this? Well, I, I think what, what you should all hope for and expect would be more tools that our customers could utilize to save and, and tools to measure and monitor their usage, both in the water and, and in electricity. I think there's going to be a lot of additional functionality. I think you're going to have more handheld type access to, to the information going forward. Um, we're providing more tools for customers you use your phone to pay your bill. Uh, we're, we're really trying to move into where we think our customers would like to see us go. But I think a lot of the, the usage tools and, and how to, uh, to measure and directly connect so you can be involved in demand response programs. You can put your EV in your, in your garage. You'll know how much it's, it's drawing. Uh, you won't have to wait even a month for a bill. You'll be able to do some self-calculations. I think you're going to have a lot more functionality as we go forward with using data and information that you didn't have. But for your plan, I mean, specifically, I, I know that you're going to move to 30-day billing. I assume that it will take the first quarter, maybe the second quarter, to sort of get that sort of system-wide, what are the next sort of updates that will happen to the customer experience so that we can anticipate those? I mean, I, I, all the functionality that you mentioned is yeah. very exciting, but what specifically is the next thing after the 30-day so, billing? So I, I think your, your full rollout of, of monthly billing is going to be an 18 to 24-month process. Again, the objective being not to add a lot of staff, not to uh, use a lot more paper, but to ensure that we, we roll it out, communicate it well, and, and try to move people to the paperless. I think that's, that's more the t realistic timeline. Uh, we're we're going to push heavily the level pay plan as well on, on how, how best our customers could utilize that system. So I, I think you'll hopefully be getting some positive results from especially our fixed and low income customers as a result. And, and so with that sort of rollout and any future rollout, how will that sort of work? I mean, so you'll present it to the commission, they'll announce, you'll announce it to them, you'll describe sort of the different steps. I mean, how do we avoid... Develop, develop a communication plan, work through your offices on how best to approach that, um, whether we use uh, common media type outlets, we do door-to-door, -door, we do mailers, we'll do a number of things to ensure that we get the message out there and try to get our customers enrolled in these programs. Got it. Mr. Blumenthal? Thank you. Um, and I also want to echo the, what you said at the beginning about recognizing that, that you've been leading the effort to try to, to right this ship and you weren't part of the effort to, you were part of the problem, you're really part of the solution and a lot of folks who are here are really part of that solution. So thank you for that. Um, is it safe to say that the, the you know, you've mentioned that the estimates are now down to regular levels, the meter reading is happening. Can we tell our constituents at this point that the CIS, the crisis, is over at this point and now we're, we're into management? Is that a fair statement? I'm going to go back to an earlier statement, then I'm going to answer this one. I, you know, while I was not directly involved in the customer service uh, implementation activity, the, the one thing I'm realizing is I should have been. And that was a failure across the board of DWP management is we, some of us didn't appreciate just how significant a project this was and how important it was to support it. And certainly now doing the deep dive into it, I've realized that it was kind of a failure across the board. Everybody's still doing their other things, but we should have all put some serious focus and support on this. And when they asked for labor resources or, or financial resources, we probably should have been a little quicker to 
to give them that support. So there was a, I think all of us take some responsibility there. As to, to um, your question, yes. I think we have a stable system at this point. I think we're in a phase of still some cleanup, and there are some little things here and there, so will every customer get a perfect bill? Uh, probably not, but they didn't before. Um, we, we had some problems before, but I would, I would tell you today and feel comfortable doing so that, that um, the expectation is a customer should, should expect when they open that bill, it's accurate and it's, it's on time. Well, that's, that's a good, good thing to hear. I wanted to drill down a little bit on some of the forensics. You mentioned that as we go back and look at what happened, the three key issues, um, are they all equally to blame or is one uh, much more so than the others in terms of the project manager versus vendor and experience versus unprepared workforce? I don't know that the vendor, the, the third party really broke it out as one being any more than the other. Um, I, I think they all greatly contributed to the result. So I, as I say here today, I can't say one was much more than the other. I, I will stand behind. I think the department tried to ensure it had all of the right people and consultants as, as we do on many of our projects and we bid them out uh, to, to bring in what we think are the best at the least cost. Um, and that brings me to a question about, about the consultants, about you know, Price Waterhouse, which I guess was the key consultant here. Um, very well-known company, very experienced, you know, you easily, you know, credible to say, well, they're, you know, they would check off the experience box. Is it a case where they, they just sent us the, you know, they're such a big organization, they sent us the inexperienced folks and that, uh, you know, is there, is there more blame that needs to be pointed at them in particular? That might be something more for a closed session discussion. Okay. Well, then I guess my question about liability, which is the follow-on to that, maybe that's also a closed session issue, but I think we really need to explore that um, because that's not acceptable. You know, I mean, if, if we're relying on a uh, third party, and particularly a, a very well-known third party, and, and, and a, one of the big criticisms with what went wrong and cost this city, as we, you know, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, um, we have to look at that. I mean, that's, there's all sorts of issues there, whether it rises to the level of a KETAM case or whether it's, you know, fraud or whether it's just mismanagement or whatever it is, that, that's something I think we need to continue to focus on, but I won't dwell on this here. Um, you mentioned poor decision making, and I see a number of things in the report, uh, but is there any particular decision that, that you can point to or that the report pointed to that really was the key, the key mistake in terms of decision making? You know, one or two of those. I think that the key was proceeding with the go live date when there were enough indicators that said we probably weren't ready. And and I think once once you 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 went forward, you kind of burned the bridge behind you, so you couldn't go back. And um, I think that was probably, if I was to point out for one, that would be it. I appreciate that. And, and similarly, you talked about the many warning signs that were ignored, and I can see some of them in the report, but is there, is there particularly, you know, red flashing warning that, that, that this report is showing that we really missed out on? What was that? Well, I, the, the report seems to highlight a number of project deliverables that were missed and delayed and, and not monitored properly, and I think that's, that's a lesson learned that we're trying to ensure that we communicate well with all of our project managers to, to really just stay on top of those issues on all of their projects and going forward. The, the other thing I think that really comes out to, to myself is scoping up front. Um, sometimes in the city here we're, we're a little light on the front end and we, we, we try to jump quickly into the RFP process I think we need to, on types of complex projects like this, we need to put more time, more effort, more resources on that initial scoping to ensure that we know what we're asking for so we don't have all of these changes all the way through and keep finding new things. 
I think if on this project we would have put a lot more effort there, we wouldn't see some of the outcome that we're seeing today. I think the other thing, and I've reported to you before, uh, that became evident here in the report is even if the billing engine was stable and working well, if you put bad information in, you get bad results out. We did not put enough resources on the data cleanup prior to going live. So we, we had some, some data errors that came on the out, as an output, but it was really not the, the billing engine itself, it was the data we were putting in it. And, and those are probably two of the keys is upfront having done more effort there. And I think it's just a, one of those lessons learned that we're gonna have to make sure we don't lose going forward. And then on the, you know, the, the unprepared or the inadequate staffing on, the, on our end, I wonder if that really, if that wouldn't have been a problem if the system had, you know, had gone more as, as would be customary without the problems, we wouldn't have had to hire all these new people for customer service and everything else. Is that, is that fair to say? Because it's, it's being listed as one of the contributors to the problem, but I'm, I look at it as sort of a, a secondary, it's not a contributor to the problem, it's, it's, it was an unexpected need because of the problem. Well, some of it was as well, the resources, uh, there, were, there were not necessarily sufficient resources on the project as it was being developed. There were, there were some limitations there. And, and so it wasn't just once you went go live and needed to do all the, you know, deal with the implementation issues, that was, that was one level, but there were also some identified resource issues on the front end. And then in terms of the, um, the pilot program for the 30-day the thing, which I think is, is great that we're moving toward that, um, I didn't quite understand, I heard you were saying 18 to 24 months to fully roll it out, but we have the pilot program first. Could you help me understand, so the, the, how long is the pilot program, and then does it then go into a phased approach, or is it at that point do we then full on put it out there and we don't we expect it to take any 18 to 24 months to get at it too. Well the pilot will be a pilot until we feel really comfortable. <laughs> uh, we're not going to make another mistake uh, with our customers. That's not that's not fair to them. So we're going to pilot it and make sure the bills are being issued, they're accurate and and it's working for our customers. We'll do some surveys with our customers and ensure that everything's working well. Then we'll roll out in the, in the phases based on areas. We'll probably work more at some of the fringe areas and work our way in uh, towards the center. And it's, it'll be based on our staffing levels for meter readers. And, and uh, we'll ensure that we have adequate resources as we add more of the customers to the system. So does the 18 to 24 month clock start when the pilot ends or does it start I think it's the department's desire that that's when the clock starts is when we start the pilot. Is when we start the pilot. Correct. Okay. So it's not, but, but it's not again, the pilot and then 18. But as I, no, and as I sit here today, I, I just want to be sure we're, we're not going to continue adding more customers just to add them if we're not comfortable that it's working properly. And we're thinking the pilot would be six months or what? Is there no, it, been a goal? It should be less, but we want to give sufficient time to do multiple billings. Uh, for those customers on, on monthly and make sure it's all working properly. Right. And then on the, the fourth item, the, which I'm also excited about moving to the, to the, um, the uh, online. Uh, paperless. Billing. Yeah, paperless billing. The, you don't have a sample of the envelope. Like how, are, how are we enticing people into it? We're just putting it as a, an option. Do we do something like they do for private sector where you have like a, picture of a check for 10 bucks and you say if you include this in your bill you can you automatically sign up and you I think the staff is currently working on that communication plan and we'd be glad to share that with you um, once they they complete that they're, they're working on that now so I'm I don't have an, an answer for you on what specifically it looks like uh, it is our desire to you know we have about 50,000 customers every month that sign for service or change service with us so as you can imagine it's a lot of customers every month with half half of our residential sector and multifamily so almost 600,000 customers um, what we're looking to do is initiate it will be a default you will have to ask not to be paperless you will be paperless 
um, that's one of the ways we're, we're going to start this process. But then we will incentivize others to, to change to paperless. Well, then I imagine, I mean, if, if, if that's the default, then, because you're saying we're expecting 9%, we're at 9%, we're expecting the average is 15%, but I would imagine if, we're, if, if that's the default, then our numbers should be in the 80%, 90% at some point soon, you know? I, I couldn't tell you, but uh, I don't know that I've seen an acceptance rate that high anywhere, but that would be wonderful. Right. If, so we, if we can get there as a city, that would be wonderful. Is there a plan, if we don't, if we don't get up to the 15% right after a year, if we're, st if we're still stuck at the 9%, what's our, what's our plan? Or do we I, think, I think we would certainly look at additional incentives if we want to do the carrot approach, or certainly we could do the other way if the, the board and council would like us to do that. On, on that note, uh, so I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. It's going to be an opt out of a paperless approach. Is that sort of what the suggestion but is? That's that's currently what we've contemplated at the department. Is when you call for a new service, uh, we will sign you into a paperless unless you ask us not to. When you sign into a new service. When you sign as a new service. Got it. Okay. So folks who are out there right now, it's not like we're going to. No. No. Okay. I'm sorry. Very good. Let me get back in my chair because the digital divide issues <laughs> in. Uh, uh, in districts like mine are significant and not everybody sort of yes, has access. And we, okay. we wouldn't want to do Very that. Very good. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, just, just one question on, on the old stuff uh, as we went through it pretty ex extensively. Um, it sounds to me like some of the problems were pretty specific and technical, but it seems like most of the problems were common sense and should have been spotted by I don't know how many people were involved enough. Um, what I don't understand is how did we go live without adequate numbers of personnel? How did we go live without adequate training? And how did we go live without adequate implementation time without a couple dozen people spotting one or all of those elements? and not saying we have to stop this now until we're actually ready to get started. Because it seems like we look for best practices, but this is just a, more of a case of common sense. How did we miss it? I mean, that's, that's an outstanding question. I, and it's easy to ask that question on Monday when the football game was on Sunday. Um, I wasn't in the midst of that those folks that were that we've talked to obviously knew they, they had a bumpy road ahead but but thought you know the potholes weren't too deep so I think at the time they they looked at the risk they had ahead versus the risk they had behind which was staying on the existing system and not going live I think they they evaluated that they had these these things before them but they made they made a decision um, so the, the report kind of has that ability now to look back and say, you really should have done differently. But I, I wasn't in the room at the time to know what, what all took place. And, and I recognize that they had a, a significant amount of pressure to, to turn the system on and to move forward. And I think they believed that they would be able to handle those challenges with those resources they had. And it wasn't the case. Yeah, I guess it, it goes without saying shockingly bad judgment, but not much we can do in retrospect. As far as the, the current issues before us, on this, this going to a 30-day billing, a 60-day billing is odd anyway, but there, there must have been a reason for it. Historically, why did we go to a 60-day billing originally and for such a lengthy period of time? Well, I don't, I don't believe the department's... Uh, rates and bills were, you know, historically they were they were always relatively low. Um, our, our climate, I mean, you have your summer months, but a lot of people initially when they were doing this billing, I mean, we've been in business 100 years and doing bi-monthly billing. So you didn't have air conditioning. I mean, you, you didn't have really significant bills. Now we bill four commodities and... Um, I'm not going to pick on wastewater, but wastewater can be as expensive as drinking water at this point for our customers. So when you now take all four of these commodities and, and the current 
prices of those commodities, um, it's a significant bill. So but in some ways that might be a good thing because if we're trying to get people to conserve and we cut the bite that they feel, is it not more likely that they'll feel less compelled to conserve? I think we're talking two different issues. I think there's conserve, but there's also, at this point, um, people's ability to, to properly budget and not have some of the, the financial pressures that they're having today. Um, the temptation is if you have cash in your wallet, you're going to spend it. And that's what we have with too many of our customers. And so we end up with more, probably a higher level of delinquency than other utilities that do monthly billing. And, and that seems to be a bigger part. We have about 300,000 of our customers that are low income today. Um, so that's a big number for, for a utility as a percentage. And, and I think those folks seem to struggle the most of just budgeting uh, for, for that two-month bill. The other thing you find that I think for conservation purposes, if you know every month what your usage is, you have a lot better ability to adjust your usage based on a bill you might be willing to pay. If you got to wait two months, you could have done a lot of damage and not dealt with it. You know, you, you might have had a leak in your house and you had it on day one of a 60-day cycle and you don't catch it. And so... Maybe it's a, a leak with your toilet, and that's not something we compensate you for when you find it. But if you had at least a 30-day, you've, you've basically 30 days that you could have had a problem, you no longer had a problem because you realized you, you, know, you found out. So I, I think we should be able to do a lot more with our customers on conservation going to a monthly bill. And uh, uh, on a... On a cost issue that also is, is obviously a conservation issue, the fourth one about uh, uh, paperless billing. Uh, why do we do so poorly compared to the average? And the average is pretty poor, too. How do we, how do we get far beyond 16%, much, much less 9%, uh, because we're, we're not able to use uh, recycled paper for reasons that I don't entirely still buy, but uh, obviously if we get to mostly paperless, it becomes a non-issue. So w have we looked at best practices around the country? Are there, are there cities that are 30 or 40 percent paperless, and how do we get there? I think the staff has looked at some best practices. I, I think to answer your question, uh, the department hasn't aggressively pushed it because we've been focused on stabilizing the bills. I think we're now to the point uh, that we're comfortable uh, aggressively pushing this and, and moving as many customers as possible to it. As you know, early on in the implementation, we had some customers that were um, auto, auto debit, and so we could just take the money out of their account to pay their bill. So that was already set up that way. And obviously, they'd received some bad bills, some quite excess, and we depleted their accounts. There's been some real cautious hesitancy at the department to, to do some things until we felt very comfortable. I think we're at that phase today. So what, what do we anticipate our time, timetable is now to, to hit high numbers? Well, we're proposing this incentive for six months to see... Um, how it evolves. We're hoping to have a, an aggressive communication campaign. And then we want to correlate it as we go to monthly billing. For those, the next groups that are going to be on monthly billing, we want to do some very targeted activity. And again, that's where I think we'll seek help from your offices when we're, we're choosing some of the routes that are in your districts, you know, to, to ensure that we get the message out and try to get as many of those customers on paperless as possible. Very good. Thank you. The uh, consultant's report also recommended that you establish a remediation implementation team separate from the customer service division and the information technology group, and that it consists of uh, the Department of Water and Power personnel and outside experts. Can you tell me a little bit about the recommendation? Is it intended to sort of on a going forward basis so that with further sort of enhancements to the system, or is there some lingering things that this uh, remediation implementation team is being charged with and have you established it so first yes we have established it we have put a remediation team we've pulled an engineer out of the power system that has significant IT and project experience 
He's leading that effort, and the focus is on outstanding defects that still exist or tasks that exist regarding stabilization or some of the tools that we do not still have in place. So uh, he, that team is also the one now managing the Oracle efforts. Um, so it, it is a technical team using consultants and internal personnel, but it has, has been established. Got it. The, um, the, the last sort of question or two that I've got here uh, is um, you mentioned that the single most, it was in response to Mr. Blumenfield's question, that the single most uh, uh, damaging uh, decision point was to go live in all of this, if you had to sort of circle it, uh, nail it down to one. When was that decision made and how does that sort of work from a process perspective? The reason I'm asking is to understand going forward how it is that we should be looking out for that moment in time. Is it a recommendation that staff made to the general manager and then the general manager reports to the commission and is that decision made at the commission level? In this case, when and where was that decision made? Again, I wasn't directly involved in that decision, but, but my, it's my, my understanding is, and if you look at the historical records, the, the, the go live date had moved multiple times already. It had been delayed multiple times. Um, so decisions had been made, they had evaluated the risk, they decided to delay it. And the target date ended up being set for Labor Day weekend uh, of 2013. So um, I think when they got close to that date, they assessed the risk, the issues, and, and brought up a recommendation. At the time, I believe the general manager gave the green light to proceed. I, I don't believe it was a board decision at all. But the general manager can make that decision? Uh, or do, does the general manager need uh, authorization from the commission? I'm not familiar with any requirement that the general manager would need authorization on a project like that. It'd be helpful for me to sort of understand how that works, uh, just so that if you know we're looking at agendas or we're, we should be asking the department to come forward and say, "Hey, we're getting close to a go live date." To me, understanding you know who makes a recommendation, who is given the authority to execute the recommendation, and when in this case, I think is really important. So if you all could sort of approximate that for us. It's we'll not so much we'll provide to that to point you. fingers to one body, but it's so that going forward, we're able to sort of bird dog some of this stuff so we can ask the questions that we're all asking on Monday after the game. Very good. So that being said, um, colleagues, let's go ahead and uh, continue items uh, two and three in committee and request the department to report back on some of the things that I've been, uh, the committee's been asking for. Uh, but to also include the status of the audit slash review being conducted by the state's joint legislative audit committee and uh, the status of the 30-day billing conversion pilot program. And so we'll get to all of that the next time we meet uh, on this item. And additionally, I'd like to request that the utility report to uh, this committee prior to the launch of any significant future updates to the billing and customer service system so that we can sort of all have our eyes on what it is that you all do, um, that we all do. I apologize for that, that we all do. On item four, we'll go ahead and note and file in as much as this report is submitted uh, for imp informational purposes. Mr. Blumenfield. Or maybe, maybe we can fold in reporting requirements about this issue with the others, since we're going to hear back on those other issues as they move forward. It would be nice to hear back. Up the uh, paperless bill in. Yeah, okay, very good. We'll, we'll roll it all into sort of this item, and that will... Uh, go for items uh, two, three, and four. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you. Uh, item number six. Item number six. Board of Public Works Report and final environmental impact report relative to the Green Acres Farm Biosolids Land Application Project with recommendation approved. You have, you have Diane Gilbert from the Bureau of Sanitation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, council members? Uh, today we have before you uh, an environmental impact report for our Green Acres uh, Farm Biosolids Land Application Program. Uh, to give you a little history and background on this is that the city purchased this facility in 2000, and we also at the same time executed a 10-year contract with our land depower and our transporter. Uh, based on some litigation we were in in 1999, there was a writ and a court order that asked the city 
uh, to do some type of CEQA evaluation to determine if these two items actually require some type of environmental documentation. Uh, the city, um, since 1999, has been um, working with Kern on these issues, and so in 2012, we actually were issued a court order to actually develop some type of environmental documentation. Uh, since that time, we have uh, implemented and prepared a draft environmental impact report, and based upon the findings for those reports, we're here today to ask for a certification of that uh, environmental impact report and also to uh, adopt the mitigation monitoring plan and also the statement of overriding considerations for that uh, report. We also uh, have looked at the conditions of the uh, environmental impact report. Uh, this is a retroactive uh, environmental impact report if there's a such thing. It's, it actually covers a time period from 2000 to 2010. But based upon uh, what's happening current today, we actually did that environmental impact report based upon current conditions and standings for 2013, 2014. So uh, we have addressed uh, some issues in that report that are actually relevant for today and outside of that retrospective uh, EIR that the courts asked us to do. Um, we've looked at uh, a gamut of uh, issues related to environmental impacts from this application that we've been doing at this site since 1994. Uh, we have addressed uh, some concerns that were brought up by the community that we're actually applying in, and it's part of this environmental impact report. And also, we have looked at greenhouse gases, which was not relevant for this retrospective EIR, but we've actually addressed it in this EIR as well. We've also looked at some issues outside the scope of environmental impact report, which are, are odors and nuisances, because that's one of the issues that is always of concern with the uh, county that we're actually applying the biosolids in. And so um, at this time, we have uh, addressed the court actions to actually look at the CEQA. We did an initial study, and then we're here today with the final in environment impact report. Mr. Blumenfield, do you have any questions? So the timing for the EIR now is just, I mean, it's just the sequence of things, or, or is there anything else to the timing? No, it's just a sequence of that, the court order that was issued in 2012 saying that we need to do some type of environmental review. So we're addressing that court order. And if we didn't have this facility, what would we do with our waste, this kind of waste? With our biosolids? Yes. Uh, we have um, actually several options that we're implementing today, uh, composting and land application and other sites that we're using. And we do uh, some composting of uh, biosolids at the Griffith Park Compost Facility. And also, we have some other land application sites in California and in Arizona. And there's also a pilot program, isn't there, to try to inject this into uh, sort of the subsurface of the uh, in the bay? I, I remember us talking about the pilot program, but none of the things that we have currently working could nearly sort of solve our biosolids challenge, if, but for the Green Acres parcel. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, we do have the Terminal Island Renewable Energy uh, Terminal project. Terminal. Yes, and, but that's a demonstration project with a pilot permit for us to operate uh, at five years, so that is a demonstration project. Soon down the road, we'll, our biosolids will be valuable. They'll be begging us for them. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this playing to the drought at all? I mean, I'm sorry. The drought issue, does that have an impact? Well, we would say that biosolids help with the droughting because of the way the material is processed. It has a, what we call a water tolerance, uh, that it's able to be applied to the land and so that you don't have to use as much water when you're using it to uh, grow crops. So we say it is a valuable in helping with the drought. Thank you. Very good. Um, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, the Bureau is still applying uh, Class A biosolids, which are the most environmentally sound. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. And, um, oh, and here's a question on Terminal Island Renewable Energy. I think I know enough of that. So very good. With that uh, being said, we are going to go ahead and communicate to the council that we approve the uh, Bureau's uh, sanitations report to adopt the specified CEQA findings as noted below, and it's on the report. I don't know if you need me to read through them, no, Mr. No. Prieto, relative to the Green Acres Farm Biosilates final EIR. Thank you. Very good. That will be the communication since we don't have a quorum. Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to item number seven. Item number seven. CO report relative proposed piggyback contract with Clean Harbors Environmental Services for as-needed routine and emergency service response for hazardous waste. You have 
Lee Chu from the CAO's office. I'm sure that good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, good morning. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Leah Chu. Um, thank you for you having me. Pull up the microphone a little bit. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leah Chu from the CAO's office. Um, the, the CAO report before you is for a proposed agreement between the Department of Recreation and Parks and Clean Harbors Environmental Services. And these are just for as needed routine, um, as needed routine and emergency response for hazardous waste management. Um, this, this contract piggybacks on Bureau of Sanitation's contract. And so the term of this contract is for, um, the initial term of the contract will expire in November 2017 and it has two three-year options to renew. Um, uh, the agreement has an annual ceiling of $500,000, and the contract, um, the department has funds in its contractual service account and also Gulf Special Account Services to, to pay for these. The services. Department of Recreation and Parks? Yes. Okay, correct. very good. That's the only question that I had is how Rec and Parks was going to pay for it, but they have it in their fund? That's correct. And it won't uh, affect the Department of Sanitation's? Uh, no. Fund? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Blumenfield? Very good. We'll go ahead and communicate to the council that we approve the Department of Recreation and Parks proposed contract with Clean Harbors for as needed routine and emergency response for hazardous waste management services as specified. Thank you. Well, I didn't even finish and they walked away. All right. <laughs> Item number eight. <laughs> Item number eight. CO report relative to proposed first amendment to contract, existing contract with ABB for system maintenance support services related to the wastewater. Okay, water. CAO, don't run off when we're done here. Uh, all right. All right. We'll Elise, uh, Ms. Matson, go ahead. Hi. Okay, so item number eight on the agenda is the CAO report on the First Amendment to contract with ABB Incorporated for wastewater control systems maintenance and support at the Donald Tillman and Los Angeles Glendale water reclamation plants. Uh, the Bureau's water reclamation plants contain automated and mechanized systems for certain aspects of the water reclamation process. These systems are used for automation, monitoring, and control of the, all the treatment operations. Uh, since 1999, the city has contracted with ABB to utilize their proprietary software to provide these services through various contracts. The proposed First Amendment will extend the term of the current contract by an additional five years and increase the cost ceiling by $1 million for a total cost ceiling of $3 million. Uh, sufficient funds are available within the Sewer Construction and Maintenance Fund to support the cost of the amendment and our office is recommending that the council authorize the Bureau to execute the First Amendment to the Bureau's proposed contract. The only question that I have is will the system be complete by the time the amendment term is, the amendment term is reached? Oh, you mean the installation of the Honeywell? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the entire, will it be sort of? The Bureau has reported that it will be in place and operational by the time that this contract expires. Very good. That's the only question that I've got. Mr. Blumenfield? Good. Very good. So in that case, we shall communicate to the full council to approve the department's proposed first amendment to an existing contract with ABB for system maintenance and support services for the wastewater distributed control systems. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Item number nine. Item number nine. Sir, actually, could we clarify for item number four the action on that? We have a question from the clerk's office. Item as number part of the as part of the billing packages, would you like to continue that one as well, or, or actual note and file to the council? Let's on the billing. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield asked that we go ahead and continue that okay. uh, and roll it into the discussion okay. in item two, since they're all part of the uh, CIS system. Great. Thank you. Very good. Item number nine. Number nine. Joint CAO Economic and Workforce Development Department report relative to the direct sale of property located at 600, 6,000. I mean Jefferson Boulevard to the Coffee Bean. We have a report from the CAO as well as uh, the, the Department of Economic and Workforce Development. Very good. I just have a, a quick question here. I, I apologize if you all feel the burning need to uh, add some more testimony, but the uh, appraisal for the property was conducted over a year ago or close to a year ago, and I'm just wondering if you all still believe that uh, estimate to be reliable for the sale of the property. Uh, uh, Josh Romer with the CAO. Uh, it's correct. The uh, General Services Department conducted an appraisal in February 2014. Um, it, uh, GSD still considers the appraisal an accurate one. Uh, and at some point during the discussions with the proposed buyer, we had to just fix, fix a, a, a price in time. So we ended up working with that price, and that's one that GSD still thinks is a, is a reasonable acquisition price. It, is the remediation cost going to be capped? 
If there are yeah. any remediation costs, I assume yes, that if there's there are remediation be some. costs. Uh, the, 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 the items going forward basically allows us to discount up to three hundred thousand dollars for remediation. If there proves to be more than that, it would have to come back to council for reconsideration to, to determine whether where additional funds could come from. But yes, it's capped for the time being at three hundred thousand dollars. My last question is: How does the bureau intend to spend these program funds? I know the, the property was initially purchased with. Um, uh, a certain type of funds. What what are the plans for the proceeds? I'm actually not familiar with what the plan uh, plans are for Bureau of Sanitation with the proceeds. I think it was originally purchased with solid waste uh, ser service fees. It's a good thing I we've got the general split. manager here. Maybe he'll <laughs> exactly. know. Uh, can, Where does the windfall go? My, my question becomes: Can the funds be used for citywide cleanup efforts in high refuse areas? Good afternoon, Khalil Garis, Bureau of Sanitation Division Manager. Um, uh, Councilman, the, uh, uh, the funds will be deposited in SWERF and then it will be used based on what's allowed for SWERF use in that fund. And SWERF is a stormwater? Sto SWERF is a solid, uh, solid, solid waste, waste resources uh, revenue. Re revenue fund. So we Re can use that for throughout the city? Yeah, it will be used for what is established by ordinance for that particular fund. Okay. Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, same question. Uh, how we determine what the money is used for it doesn't go back to the general funds it stays within SWERF yes not it will stay yes <laughs> it will be deposited in SWERF can, can you just tell us a little bit about SWERF so you refresh my memory and, and Mr. Blumenfield's excuse me can you tell us a little bit about SWERF again so so what is it it's established by ordinance it's it's established by ordinance for the sort to service all the resident for the collection and management of the solid resources we call it solid resources now we don't call it a solid waste because we're, we're looking for it to be a zero waste city in 2025 so, so it's srf not swrf fund S, the swrf sw so but it still says solid waste resources so it's revenue fund revenue fund okay yeah. And so, it's, so those monies can be used for solid waste purposes throughout the city of Los Angeles? Yes. Do you have any uh, uh, idea of how you'll spend the seven or so million dollars that will come from the sale of this property? Uh, no, we, we, at, at this time, it will be deposited in that fund and it will be used for you know, the service that we provide. And, the, could, and that fund, uh, is that something that, uh, it doesn't go through the normal budget cycle, does it? For the, for, uh, for, we won't see it, it's a special fund. That's right. Th no. Better run for this one. No, it is. It's, it, yeah. Because I'd like to see yeah. an accounting of how, uh, similar to capital improvement project lists, how is it that you queue the money and how is it prioritized? Absolutely. Lisa Maori Sanitation. Uh, the, the SWERF fund is part of the budgetary process. It has a schedule in the budget, Schedule 2. So as Khalil had mentioned, these proceeds will return to the fund and they will be able to be used for any SWERF eligible so it could cover the cost of our uh, refuse collection drivers. It could be used to buy vehicles. It could be used for some of our capital projects. Um, basically, it returns to the big pot of, of money from which we do all of the appropriations for the program. But it gets programmed through the budget process. It does get programmed so through we, the budget we process. We do see it then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, very good. Any additional questions, Mr. Bloomingfield? All right, so we will go ahead and approve uh, the CAO and uh, Economic Workforce Development Department report recommending the direct sale of the property located at 6000 Jefferson Boulevard to the coffee, bean, and tea leaf as specified. Thank you. Very good. There are no public comment cards. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of our meeting, Mr. Prieto. We are adjourned. Thank you.